what's up everyone, Sergeant Arger right here, and today, we are doing our part three of our great Roman series, how Aurelian restored Rome, Battle of Emesa, where we left off, Aurelian did a rushing blow, like, you know, just taking over all of well, Aurelian's men had a crushing blow. They took out back Egypt, Anatolia, and now they're closing in on Syria. Yeah, pretty nice. Pretty nice. Um, without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna see if I can do all this in one take. But this is pretty long, so... What did I do? What the heck? But if this doesn't get too long, I might have to cut it into two. Anyways, let's get started. In light of the Battle of Imus, oh, Zenobia arrived in Antioch to retinue to bolster morale. The unwelcome news that her heavenly oh, loud is that? had been badly defeated by lighter units oh. surely came as unexpected. Having lost some of their best cavalry and needing reinforcements, the Palmarine position at Antioch had become untenable, and there was a real oh, no. danger of encirclement if they chose to stay and fight. But a hasty retreat would have spread panic and could prompt the citizens to rise against the Palmarines in order to gain favor with the victor. Fearing betrayal by the people of Antioch, Zabdas employed a clever ruse to buy some time. He fabricated a victory at Ime. To back Wait, what? his claim, he found a man who resembled Aurelian in age and build. Doppelganger, what the him in clothes that looked somewhat imperial, and then paraded him in chains through the city streets, giving off the impression that the Palmarines had not only won the battle, mm. but had captured the Roman Emperor alive. Their ruse, mm, not smart, was, however, I guess. would only last for so long, as Aurelian's army would appear in front of the city walls in no more than a day. While the people day, enjoyed geez. the procession and the subsequent celebrations, Zenobia and Zabdas made preparations to abandon the city. The following night, they slipped... Hey guys, this is why you don't trust the government. Like, what the heck? ...to abandon the city. The following night, they slipped out of Antioch under the cover of darkness and marshaled their army south to... What? <laughs> They're just gonna abandon it, okay. We're Mesa. Despite this setback, Queen... Jeez, I keep forgetting how big Armenia was. Queen Zenobia remained defiant. She still possessed cavalry reserves that far outnumbered those available to the enemy. Her army was more than capable of stopping Aurelian and turning the tide of the war. When the sun rose the next day, the citizens of Antioch were in for a rude awakening. Seeing that the Palmarines had retreated, oh, no. many who had staunchly supported Zenobia feared reprisals from Aurelian. Some of the officials and aristocrats fled into the surrounding countryside. Meanwhile, the Roman Emperor was encamped some 20 kilometers east of the city, still unaware that Zabdas had withdrawn his troops. Oh no. So wait, so what are they gonna do? Having dealt a blow to the enemy's heavy cavalry, Aurelian could now safely deploy his infantry against Antioch and send the cavalry around the city to encircle the Palmarine position. It was only sometime after daybreak that he learned of Zenobia's complete withdrawal, and he marched to the city at once. This video is brought to you by our No, thank you. No document on fiction streaming and gates and a warm reception. 
The city clearly tried to do everything not to. Oh my gosh! The Another celebration, but this time, sort of the opposite of the last celebration. For his part, Aurelian showed that he was not interested in retribution. Upon learning that some of the city's elites had fled in fear of reprisals, he issued a general pardon to all citizens of Antioch. Nice. But his political maneuvering didn't stop there. He published edicts far and wide, advertising to the people of Syria that he considered those who had collaborated with Zenobia to have done so under pressure rather than of their own free will, thus absolving them of any penalties. This cal oh, goodness. calculated policy of clemency immediately had a desired effect. His troops were welcomed by the locals. Bartering for provisions brought business to local markets, craftsmen and shopkeepers. And, most importantly for the Emperor's long-term planning, the wealthy elite that had fled Antioch returned to the city with gratitude. Moreover, nice. a march further into Syria would likely be met with much less hostility, and, crucially, the large fortified cities were now less likely to offer resistance, which would otherwise force Aurelian into prolonged and costly sieges. By embracing the wealthy Syri- Oh, I'm dumb. These Little dots are just forts, or like cities. There's a ton of these things, wow. Syrian aristocracy that opposed him, the emperor not only- It's like, I asked that in like the second episode, I think. Like, what are all these tiny dots? He freed up troops that he needed for the war against Zenobia, but also secured the local logistical support for his army in Syria. However, Aurelian was detained at Antioch for a time, due to administrative and military considerations. Years what? of Palmarine rule, increasingly at odds with the central imperial government, brought about changes to the administration that needed to be addressed. First, at the fore of these issues was the imperial mint, which Aurelian temporarily closed. Second, the Emperor dealt with the growing problem of the Christian Schism by deposing Paul of Samosata, the divisive Bishop of Antioch, who had received patronage from Zenobia. On the military side of things, a pressing issue was the Palmarine garrison at Daphne, just south of Antioch, which had been left behind as a rearguard by Zabdas as he withdrew south. This contingent was unlikely to pose a threat, but its position above the strategic narrow gorges could hinder Aurelian's advance and inflict serious losses on his army. This made the Palmarine contingent both impossible to ignore and difficult to dislodge. Aurelian opted for a full frontal assault with his infantry, oh, wow. who had yet to see action on the battlefield in the war against Palmyra. Oh goodness, I'm curious. Uh... I have a slight worry that this might not go well. The legionaries formed the famed Testudo formation and attacked oh. up the steep slopes, battling their way up the hill under a heavy rain of missiles, including darts. That must be horrifying, oh my gosh. And stones. With their shields closed together over their heads, Aurelian's infantry made the ascent without suffering heavy losses. Okay, never mind. This went extremely well. And once atop the hill, they made short work of breaking through the enemy defenses. They put the Palmarines to flight in such disorder that some were driven over the cliff's edge and were dashed to pieces on the precipices Whoa. below. Such a direct assault would have otherwise been considered reckless, but in contrast with his public show of clemency, Aurelian made sure to demonstrate to everyone his capability to deal swiftly with any dissent. Hmm. The secondary military reason that delayed the Emperor was reinforcements. Aurelian welcomed contingents from the recently retaken Tiana, as well as the various other towns of Cappadocia, all on their way to join the Emperor's army. He deliberately waited to provoke defections of other Roman units in the east who abandoned Zenobia's cause 
and joined Aurelian. To the south, Marcus Aurelius Probus was similarly delayed while he welcomed defections of various military units from Phoenicia and Palestine. At last ready to move south, Aurelian was received with open arms by the towns and villages along his itinerary, most notably the cities of Apamea, Larissa, and Arethusa. However, he soon came upon the army of Zenobia and Zabdas. Dang, they look outnumbered. Look at that. Zabdas drew up the Palmarine army on the plains north of Emesa, some 50,000 strong. His host was reinforced with large numbers of Klibanari to replace those who had been lost in the previous encounter. And this time, the battlefield was of his own choosing, well suited for mailed heavy cavalry. Aurelian's ranks, meanwhile, had swelled. Oh, they're not that outnumbered. Look. Actually, yeah, they're not that outnumbered. Okay. Like, I don't know. Like, just from this perspective, it looks like there's four of these cavalry, eight of these cavalry squares, only six of these guys' cavalry squares. Like, I don't know. I'm probably just counting the number of squares. Held as well. He had crossed into Asia with some 36,000 troops. But reinforcements from the newly conquered eastern provinces brought his army up to around 45,000. Okay, guys, if this video goes past, like, 37 minutes, that's when I'm probably going to split it into two parts. How are we doing on time? Okay, 12 minutes. Not too bad. Both commanders stationed their cavalry on the flanks and infantry in the center. The Palmarine cavalry arm was superior, not only because of their armor, but also their superior numbers. In addition to their Klibanari, the Palmarines probably also employed elite Oshonian armored horse archers and Palmyra's local light cavalry and dromedary archer units. Again, the Roman Emperor took the initiative. His infantry, interspersed with veterans from the campaigns against the Iatungi, Vandals and Goths, were tasked with breaking their counterparts. Meanwhile, he planned to keep the Palmarine cavalry occupied. He feared that the superior numbers of the enemy cavalry would allow Zabdas to hit his infantry on the flanks. Marcellinus, one of his most trusted lieutenants, was to use his own cavalry to deter an envelopment through the use of non-committal tactics of harassment. If successful, the Klibanari and Zenobia's other mounted units would not be able to commit to an envelopment of Aurelian's center, so long as the fast-moving Dalmatians and Moors were in a position to outmaneuver them and hit them on the flanks. Why aren't they called Moors, by the way? Aren't the Moors like the... Like the Muslims that were in Spain that like invaded I Iberia? Like in 780 or something? Like what are these Moors? So, uh, yeah, what, what, what are these Moors? Where do they come from? But Zabdas had learned from his previous defeat. He Oh yeah. That is true. He has the benefit of, like, he learned from his last defeats. He has more numbers. He has better troops. He's fighting in home territory. Like, I don't know. Everything about this is favored on the Palmarine side. Ordered his heavy cavalry to advance on the enemy at a slower pace to give the impression that they would again fall into the trap of a feigned retreat. But they waited for the opportune moment when the enemy came in too close before charging at full gallop. Oh no! The battle did not begin as Aurelian had hoped. You think? He had ordered his mounted units to withdraw before the charge of the enemy and fight an evasive battle of harassment. Oh. 
but the Kalinari oh. pursued the Emperor's cavalry with such ferocity that they were unable to maintain their distance. Locked in close quarters fighting, and also facing ranged attacks from Zabdas's horse archers and dromedary archers, the Dalmatians and Moors were hard pressed, and many fell. But despite their troubles, they no! successfully occupied Zenobia's cavalry, buying time for the infantry in the center. Well, I guess that was their intention to buy time to attack. After facing so. down a palmarine rain of arrow fire, Aurelian's infantry charged the enemy formation, their momentum driving back Zabdas's center. However, the situation for the Dalmatians and Moors on the flanks was critical. What was supposed to be an orderly tactical withdrawal was close to becoming a rout. If their wow. lines faltered, the whole army would quickly become surrounded. Aurelian decided to gamble. Seeing the trouble his cavalry were in, he detached infantry from the main line to wheel about and aid the embattled flanks. So how does he expect to beat these guys when they're better equipped and they outnumber them? I don't understand how he's doing so well against the infantry. This action sapped the forward push of his units in the center, and Zabdas was immediately able to counter. Aurelian's veterans held firm, but the less experienced troops fared badly, their lines faltering against superior numbers of the Palmarine infantry. But, just as the battle seemed lost, Aurelian's gamble proved decisive. Zabdas's Klibanari brought the full force of their charge upon Aurelian's cavalry. But in doing so, their own formation had fragmented into smaller groups as they made every effort to chase down the nimble riders. Wow, this is becoming a close battle. Like... Close enough to where I can see Aurelian easily losing. Aurelian's infantry exploited the gaps where the club armed Palestinians were especially effective in the tight spaces. Their blunt weapons proved devastating against the heavily armored Palmarine cavalrymen. Marcellinus rallied the cavalry and the Klibanari began taking many casualties. Their formations oh, wow. held fast and repelled repeated attacks. But, overwhelmed and attacked from two sides, their numbers dwindled, and the survivors fled the field. By this time in the center, Whoa. Aurelian's infantry formation had stabilized and was slowly chipping away at Zabdas's line. Wow. Seeing that the battle is lost, the remaining Palmarine troops lost heart. That Aurelian and his infantry were able to respond to a critically dangerous situation. How did they win? What the heck? Situation with. How did those infantry do so well? Uh, like, uh, how? I. Uh, that is crazy. Such flexibility in the heat of battle and thereby win both the infantry and cavalry engagements while his cavalry retained their discipline when hard pressed reflects both the veterancy of his men honed through years of military crisis and their confidence in his strong leadership mm. the few palmarine survivors staggered back to a mesa after an impromptu council of war with her generals and advisors Zenobia decided to retreat to the relative safety of Palmyra itself. Wow. With Aurelian closing in fast, the queen and her retinue abandoned the royal treasury in their haste. The Emocenes threw open their gates to the emperor, but he did not dwell there for long. Rather than returning to Apamea in the north and then taking a southeasterly route to the city of Palmyra, Aurelian led his army in direct pursuit via the shorter but more dangerous easterly route from a mesa hey. across the treacherous dry steppe. His army was harassed by the raids of brigands, but they soon arrived at the trade metropolis. Oh boy. 
Palmyra did not possess. Also, by the way, I know this is a random, but like, do you guys also want me to direct to Kings and Generals? I've seen them before, and they're pretty nice. And I haven't gotten many, like, suggestions to do them, so. Y'all want me to do that? Is that something y'all want me to do? Just curious. It's a circuit wall at this time, and Zenobia's troops could do little more than to occupy strategic points in the hope of stopping the enemy. The Queen hoped that the stores and granaries inside her city would enable her to outlast the enemy. However, the city was hopelessly surrounded. Moreover, Aurelian took great care to cut off the approach of a force of Persians, perhaps mercenaries, who had arrived to assist Palmyra. Oh, he also received assistance and supplies from the Arabic. To oh yeah! Why doesn't this? Why don't the Sassanids invade? This is literally like the perfect time for the Sassanids to come in and destroy Rome. Like, the, the barbarians are doing it. The barbarians have no problem invading them. Why aren't the Sassanids doing it? Like, this is the perfect time. I don't... Like, look, there's an open route right there. The Nuke Confederation, who were enemies of Zenobia. Zenobia needed outside help. She slipped out of the city during the night on a dromedary and traveled east, intending to meet with the Persian king, Bahram I, to secure his support. Oh my gosh. Be, Aurelian was alerted to her escape and sent cavalry in pursuit. Is she gonna get captured? They caught up with her as she was attempting to cross the Euphrates by boat and brought her to the Emperor. Wow. The people of Palmyra were initially divided with some wishing to continue the fight. But Aurelian's reconciliatory policy fostered a series of defections, which eventually persuaded the city's inhabitants that they could trust in Aurelian's mercy. He entered the city in triumph and distributed much of its wealth to his soldiers. The war had been won. Aurelian now... Dang, well that's that. Dealt with that pretty well. The Just a couple of years. Difficult task of restructuring the eastern frontier, which had fallen into disarray during the war with Palmyra. The Persians would have surely sought to capitalize on the crisis. Yes, exactly. As Rome was facing, but they faced their own internal problems following oh. the death of Shapur the First in 270 A.D. Oh, okay. Needless to say, the Persians were now anxious to avoid a full-scale war with the victorious Aurelian. Thus, the Emperor was able to reach an understanding with Bahram I. He entrusted the reintegration of the Syrian provinces into the Empire and the restructuring of the eastern frontier to Marcellinus, one of his most reliable marshals. With the affairs of Palmyra and the eastern border arranged to his satisfaction, Aurelian returned to Emesa, where he put Zenobia and some of her key supporters on trial. It was here that some of Zenobia's most prominent supporters faced the harshest punishment, including Cassius Longinus, an intellectual from Emesa. Zenobia herself was spared, but not out of any regard for the dignity of her position. Aurelian was aware that the formidable queen came close to defeating the imperial war machine and undoubtedly still enjoyed much support in the east. Thus, she was paraded through the cities of Syria on the back of a camel and, according to one source, was chained up on a high structure in Antioch for three days. Such humiliation was not prompted by cruelty, but by calculated political considerations. The myth of a Cubes. having finally felt he had brought stability to the east, Aurelian assumed the title. Yeah, I get that. That's what um the Americans said with Emperor Hirohito. They let him live and everything. So and let him like stay, you know, in Japan and all that. So that way, like, 
Japanese would be loyal to the Americans. Because if they just killed the Emperor, who the Japanese literally saw as a god, then there's no way they would let the Americans occupy them. So yeah, that makes sense. Restorer of the world, and embarked on a journey west with his hostages and the vast wealth plundered from Palmyra. His ultimate propaganda goal was to display Zenobia and Vabalathus in Rome during his triumphant return. While the preparations for this elaborate procession were being made, in 273 AD, Aurelian was they were literally destroyed. Mauricia, having to camp they were destroyed. They were dest what? They were, they were just destroyed earlier. Oh my god. Against an invasion by the Carpi. Oh, the Carpi. What the heck is the Carpi? That's such a stupid name. What in the heck is the Carpi? I've never heard of them before. But trouble was again brewing in the east. <sighs> Some of Palmyra's leading men sought to revise their political... Why? ...fortunes and attempted to persuade Marcellinus to usurp as emperor. What? Playing for time with vague answers, Marcellinus remained loyal and informed the emperor of what was happening. Growing impatient, the conspirators then clothed a certain Antiochus in the imperial purple. Incensed, Aurelian hastened back east with minimal preparations. Through a series of forced marches, he arrived at Antioch, surprising the inhabitants who were attending a horse race. From there, he rushed to Palmyra, catching the conspirators off guard and taking the city without a fight. This time, however, there would be no mercy. Although he spared Antiochus as a man of insignificant birth, who was clearly propped up by the wealthy elites, the Emperor's soldiers were given permission to strip the city bare and take as much plunder as they could carry. Palmyra would never again Dang. pose a threat to Rome. However, where are that city is now? The Emperor had no. Oh, so what is this city? The tip of his upload upon. Is that Baghdad? I think I asked that like in episode one. Is that looks exactly or close to where Baghdad is? No time to waste. He hastened south to deal with an insurgency in Alexandria. How many freaking insurgencies are there gonna be? Just leave. Oh my gosh. What are you when has this, uh, when has the, these insurgencies ever been successful? They've never happened. Every time there's been a civil war or an insurgency or like some kind of thing, like it, it's always been crushed. Like what the hell, man? So rude. This Just like massacre the city. Everyone. Rebellion was led by adherents to Zenobia, which to avoid punishment, led by a man named Firmus. In the fierce fighting that followed, much of the prosperous Brookian district, which included the Ptolemaic royal palace, was destroyed. Great job, Firmus. The rebellion, and had Firmus strangled to death. Good. In 274, the victorious emperor turned his attention to the Gallic Empire. This final campaign of reunification consisted of both diplomacy and ferocious fighting on the battlefield. Oh my gosh, that is going to be difficult. The Gallic Emperor Victorinus had been assassinated in 271. Oh well, look, the city of London, Neum. Looks almost like a London in the same place. And his successor, Tetricus, was both fearful of Aurelian and anxious about sedition within his own forces. Being aware of the Emperor's reputation for clemency, Tetricus wrote a letter to Aurelian offering to surrender. Dang. However, it appears that Aurelian would only accept his surrender if he offered up his army as a sacrifice. And so, in the autumn of 274, Tetricus conspired with Aurelian to meet in battle on the Catalonian Plains, an open expanse of land that would have favored Aurelian's cavalry 
including perhaps the former surviving cataphracts of Zenobia. Tetricus led forth his army, only to then abandon them and ride over to Aurelian's side of the battlefield in a show of surrender. However, the Romano-Gallic army was an experienced force. They had successfully crushed Germans, usurpers, and re Oh, so the Germanic tribes did invade the Gal- the, 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 the Gallows, or whatever you call them, the Gallics. Because, like, in the- in the first episode, or episode 1.5, I was like, what the heck, man, all these barbarians are invading Rome. Why don't they invade the Gallics, or the Gallows? Like, they seem to be pretty weak. And, but no, it turns out, they did. The German- the Germanic tribes did invade them, and they just held them off. Rebel cities, and had twice defeated the excellent military emperor, Gallienus. They were still a cohesive and strong enough force to fight Aurelian without their emperor. Nevertheless, Dang. the Gallic army was slaughtered in a massive and hard-fought battle that reunited the empire, but also, due to the Gallic losses, temporarily compromised the security of the Rhine frontier. Don't, don't do this. If that starts to say, oh my, oh my gosh, if the, if the Germanic barbarians start invading, I'm just gonna lose it. Finally, at the, okay, at good. the end of 274, Aurelian returned to Rome what to time celebrate his grand triumph over okay. barbarians and usurpers. Tetricus and his son Tetricus II were made to walk before Aurelian's triumphal chariot. Oh, nice. But also marching before Aurelian was the once mighty queen Zenobia. Wait, is this the last episode? Oh, oh my gosh. That's sad. A jewel in Aurelian's crown. She was shackled in gold chains and adorned with large gems so heavy that she could barely walk. Aurelian soldiers handed out free bread to the citizens, and the Emperor was hailed a hero by his subjects. Aurelian pardoned Tetricus, rewarding him for turning over the Gallic Empire by making him the governor of Lucania in southern Italy. Likewise, Palmyra's moment in the sun had come to an end, but Zenobia now embarked on a new life. Aurelian gave her an estate in Tivoli, and she married a Roman senator. Thereafter, she lived in Italy with her children, now a member of Rome's senatorial elite. The Dang. ever busy Aurelian was still not yet able to rest. In 275, he I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> he returned to Gaul to restore the weakened Rhine frontier, putting down Gallic unrest and defeating Germanic oh, incursions okay. into both Gaul and Raetia. Okay, so it's not that bad. He then made his way to the Balkans to deal with a new series of Gothic raids into Thrace. Yeah, the Goths were slaughtered. Why do they keep... Oh my, can the goths just like leave? Like, I get it, they're like... Okay. I get it, they're pushed out. Like, from the Huns and the other people. But like, can they just die? Like, what the heck? They're so annoying. ...and Asia Minor. However, Aurelian never finished this campaign. As an administrator, no! he was known to be strict, handing out severe punishments to corrupt officials and soldiers. His secretary Eros feared for his life on account of his own corruption. To save his own skin, he took Byzantium. He forged a document listing the names of men supposedly marked by Aurelian for execution. High-ranking officers of the army were on that list. Fearing punishment, they murdered Aurelian in September 275 in Thrace. Aurelian's death prevented a full restoration of political stability that could have ended the cycle of assassinations and civil wars. Well, 
To be fair, it did end, like, 30 years later. But then after that, it got really bad. His short reign had reunified a disintegrating empire and secured its frontiers, effectively giving Rome a new lease of life that lasted another 200 years. Nice. Reddit goes to our awesome people. Wow, that was a fantastic series. Thank you all for watching, everyone. I really enjoyed that. Um, if you're new, subscribe. If you're not, subscribe. Um, like, like the video. And if you dislike the video, dislike it. And comment. And what did I just do? Oops. Okay, anyways, goodbye. Well, everyone, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. And you know, turn on the notification bell thingy. And if you didn't, then make sure to leave a um, thumbs down. But yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. And while you're at it, go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, and if not better, than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos, don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that I either know or I have in high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees. So, thank you for watching and have a great day.